My name is Pastor Corwin Lazenby. I'm the senior pastor of Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church of South Chicago. Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church has been in the South Chicago area for 98 years this year. We're excited about our long heritage here in the community, and we know that South Chicago has been filled with a group of diversified people down through the decades, and so we are excited about how our community is knitted together. And not only are we excited about how our community is knitted together, but we want to continue to build, to build uh, stronger alliances. Am I right about it? So we want to be able to start our address on tonight Again, about uh, uniting our voices, uniting our voices uh, with this alliance and the organizations in the 10th Ward that we've come together to address these diverse issues in our community. Uh, this event is sponsored, if you look around at all the banners, there are many different organizations that have come together on tonight that we would make this form available for all of those who would come and also be able to uh, speak freely but also to listen. All right, tonight we have a broad representation of Latino, African American, and white voters who have come from various parts of the 10th Ward and surrounding areas to listen to the candidates speak on issues that directly impact them. And so tonight I pray as we come together that we would be orderly when we have our questions, if we could ask our questions. Tonight we're not here to bash anyone. Tonight we're here to get uh, answers to our questions, all right? All right. So our ground rules, here are our ground rules. Rules for the candidates. Respect our timekeeper, Tasha Baker from Claritian and Associates will be our timekeeper. Please stand, Tasha. Come on and give Tasha a hand. <laughs> to our candidates, please do not go over your time on the microphone or it will be turned off. Respect the other candidates, no jeering, no insults. Remember, we are in church, so no lying. <laughs> no partisan applause or yelling from the volunteers, no electeering inside of the church. Rules for the audience. Everyone, please turn off your cell phones. Hold your applauses until the end of the event. Respect everyone present. No partisan applauding or yelling. No candidate buttons, t-shirts, or literature to be passed out inside of the building. Bathrooms are in the front here, uh, behind the doorway on our left, behind the candidates, so we need them. Tonight, we have three moderators. We have guest moderator Curtis Black. Come on and give him a hand. Please wave to us, Curtis. From the Chicago Reporter and two community moderators, Mr. Dale Williams, the chairman of trustees of Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church. And Isabella Martinez, she's from Central Day Travajalotes Trava Unitaris. I tried. She's a part of the Immigrant Workers Project. Uh, I will let them announce themselves. Curtis, if you would come. Come on and give Curtis a hand. Hi. I'm Curtis Black. I uh, do a weekly uh, blog on government accountability and local politics for the Chicago Reporter. Chicago Reporter is an investigative magazine that's been around for nearly 50 years, focusing on race and poverty. I've been writing about this community for many, many years. I looked back, and the first piece I think I and I've covered uh, various things, Pet Coke and the Lakeside. So I'm very honored to be here. And uh, who's next here? Isabel. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Curtis. Hi, my name is Isabel Martinez. I am one of the board members for Centro de Trabajadores Unidos Immigrant Workers Project. Um, CTU was founded in 2008. We are a community organization that advocates for labor and immigrant rights. Um, si alguien necesita traducción del evento, por favor vayan atrás a que le den el equipo. Thank you. Right. Good evening. My name is
name is Daryl Williams. I'm the um, chairman of the trustee board at Pure Baptist Church. Um, we've been serving the South Chicago community for over 98 years. Um, I'm sorry. And I'll be one of your community moderators for this event tonight. Um, we would like to welcome our automatic candidates for the 10th Ward, Alderman John Pope. And Susan the first, the first part of the meeting will be a debate after they introduce themselves. Each candidate will, will, there will be a series of questions and each candidate will get one minute to uh, answer each question after it's read, followed by a 30 second period for a rebuttal for each. The questions being asked were put together by the organization sponsoring the event, and they reflect the communities that they represent. And for the latter part of the event, questions will be taken from an audience. You have each been given an index card to write your questions down. So the guideline for the questions, questions will be read for both candidates to answer. We will only read the questions that are not repetitive and nonpartisan. We will read questions that do not have personal attacks. Also, just a little side note, Please answer the question, and also during your rebuttal, no personal attacks, just to talk about what you would do. All right. Um, each candidate will have one minute response to each question so that we can hear the responses to more questions. Ushers, if you could, please start collecting the cards. Before we begin our questions, each candidate will have one minute to introduce themselves. We'd like to start with Alderman John Pope. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Asse for hosting this event. And I am John Pope, the 10th Ward Alderman. I'm a lifelong resident here in the community and have been proud to serve the 10th Ward, the very large, diverse, and challenged ward since 1999. And I'm proud of the miscellaneous, the various accomplishments we've made during some of our country's most pressing, challenging times. We've gone through several crises in recent years, from the housing crisis to the Great Recession, and all in the Southeast Side community who's already challenged with the closure of the steel mills. I'm proud of the successes we made on all different levels, education, job development, affordable housing, and I believe I know I'm the most qualified person to lead the, to lead the 10th Ward forward. It's been an honor to serve you folks, and I look forward to serving you in the next four years. Thanks for your support. Hi, thank you so much for putting this together, everyone. My name is Susan Sidlowski Garza. I'm a lifelong resident of the 10th Ward. My family has been part of this ward for over 140 years. I am currently area vice president for the Chicago Teachers Union, which encompasses 69 schools. Every school within the 10th Ward is within my jurisdiction. I am a counselor at Jane Addams Elementary School. I've been working there for 22 years. My mother went to school there, I went to school there, my children went to school there, so I've been inside the walls of Jane Addams for 46 years. I love the 10th Ward. Um, I was born here, and I raised my family here. Um, I believe that I am the best person for this job because I know as a counselor, I'm a good listener, I'm a leader, and I'm a doer. And I think after uh, 16 years, I think the 10th Ward residents are ready for a change. Thank you. Opening statements. The first question is on neighborhood safety. The fourth police district, which covers most of the 10th Ward, has the third, the third highest crime rate in the city and the fourth highest for violent crimes. It consistently ranks in the top five districts with the highest rates of domestic violence in the city. We also have the second most violent police beat in Chicago. Residents cannot travel freely around the 10th Ward to access needed services for fear of gang retaliation and violence. So the question is, if elected alderman, specifically, what would you do to address crime in our area? And what would you do along 91st Street and Burley, where there are schools, library, and a number of social service organizations? Alderman Pope. Thank you. I understand the importance of site safety and crime in our neighborhoods throughout the 10th Ward, not just here in South Chicago. And it is very important. I've had a long-standing relationship with our police. And I want to thank them. Many of the men and women of the Chicago Police Department are here today. 
and I've been fortunate to, really, to receive the endorsement of those men and women who work hard in our community. Uh, I've been very active over the years in this neighborhood with CAPS, with programs that benefit and protect not only our children, but our adults. The RAIN program that we instituted with Commander Navarro, residential area in need, that's an opportunity to direct resources where they're needed. But I understand not just more police are needed, but more creative ways of addressing criminal activity, using technology where possible, and getting people involved. This is a social service corridor. We have a crime camera, we've had a crime camera here, we need to reinstate that. We will do that. We work closely with OLG, Claritians, Metropolitan Family Services to provide programs that will keep our kids off the street and away from crimes. And I believe in tough gun laws. Ms. Car Ms. Carza, what would you do to address crime in our area and specifically what would you do to, about safety along 91st, 91st and Burley? Um, our ward needs to address the issue of violence in our neighborhood at its roots. Uh, poverty and lack of opportunity leaves our youth behind. Um, for 15 years, I've been the program director at Hagwish Community Committee, bringing after-school programs and grant money to the youth of the southeast side. We need to create jobs and programs that will enable our youth to have positive alternatives to gangs and drugs. We need to create neighborhood block watches that include every precinct and com every community organization. We need to work with the Chicago Police Department and the Fraternal Order of Police to build better relationships between residents and the police department that focuses on building trust and mutual respect. This is the social service corridor, but I believe that we need not, it doesn't need to just be here in South Chicago. We need to replicate what's here and move that a little bit farther south so the people in Hegwish and the east side can have access to it too. So now you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal, Alderman Pope. Yes, in addition to taking those proactive uh, safety criminal acts, we've got to look to empower the kids and the adults with additional programs that keep them off the street. That's why taking advantage of working with local organizations like the YMCA, like working with the South Chicago Art Center, who I'm pleased to say is opening a brand new facility down the street, like working with Ceasefire and Safe Passage, those are the elements, those are the actual programs and activities that will improve the safety for all of us. And again, strict gun laws, and more cooperation with the police. For the past 15 years, as I said, I worked with Hegwish Community Committee to create those programs and implement them. Um, the past, uh, the budget cuts by Mayor Rahm Emanuel that our current alderman voted yes on created cuts in after school programs and left no, chill, no place for our youth to go. Um, we need to reinstate those funds so kids do have a safe place and positive alternatives are right there at their back door. We can't we keep doing budget cuts because it just it doesn't work. This microphone. All right. Thank you. Now we have a question of, about affordable housing. I'm trying to find a sweet spot for the Maybe hold it like that. All right, the city council has passed an amendment to the Affordable Requirement Ordinance, ARO. This voluntary program mandates that market rate developers receiving assistance from the city either build one out of every 10 housing units for low to moderate income families per development or pay a mandatory fee. Previously, the fee was $100,000 per unit. With the new amendment, developers can pay a reduced fee of 50,000 instead of building much needed affordable units and or build these units up to two miles away from their developments. Here's the question. How do you plan to ensure that market rate developers in the 10th ward build affordable units on site and if they do choose to pay the fee instead, how would you ensure that the money is targeted towards housing families within the 10th ward? Candidate Garza. First, I would ensure that residents have the proper understanding and resources to be able to identify that they would be a victim of housing discrimination. Secondly, my administration would focus on addressing the root causes of economic inequality by attracting living wage employment opportunities in our ward. Finally, I would mandate any new housing development have a minimum of 30% low income housing options. This is vital to the people of the 10th Ward, where 
38% of our, the people that live here are victims of redlining or um, you know, uh, housing discrimination. So we need to make sure that they're educated on what that is and how they can prevent it. Alderman Pope. Thank you, I have a long history of supporting and advocating for affordable housing in this community. I've had the opportunity over the years to work with groups like, again, Clarice and Associates and the Spanish Coalition for Housing where we've been successful in bringing affordable housing to this neighborhood. Just down the street, the Victory Center, the Senior Center is an example of that, as well as Casa Kirk, family. And up and down the street, we see new homes for Chicago, programs that I've been supportive of since day one, working in collaboration with our local agencies. The ARO was mentioned, the Affordable Renters, the Affordable Requirements Ordinance, that is something that I've supported in the past and just was proud to support in the last city council. How do you get developers to stay ad adhering to that? Or you force them to do that with an RDA, and anyone in development knows that, a redevelopment agreement. They want to come into the ward, they have to abide by our RDA, and especially as it pertains to city-owned property. There's several lots here in the community that are available for redevelopment. If we want to bring housing in, we should mark it as we have those lots, but we have the ability then to tie those developers to the restrictions that we want. All right. Candidate Garza, you now have 30 seconds to respond. The Alderman's office needs to be a plethora of information. The information that's provided that you're speaking of right now needs to be brought to the people so they know where to get these programs. Um, it's important that not just Victory Center and these um, senior homes are wonderful for our seniors, but we have tons of families that need the same affordable housing as well as seniors. So it doesn't just need to, we can't just focus on seniors, we need to vo focus on the whole community. Alderman Pope. And maybe my opposition didn't hear me, but we talked about senior housing, family housing, and individual homes up and down the street. Um, I find it ironic that you're supporting affordable housing when you yourself haven't been diligent on paying your real estate taxes. Items that affect the bottom line. No personal attacks. Alderman Pope. Yep. Just, just what you would do, the, re the, re the rebuttal. Ma one second, ma'am. One sec, ma'am, ma'am, please, please, please. What, what, we mentioned, what, what we mentioned opening up was no personal attacks. We also said, all right, we also said that when we as the audience, we represent, we represent the 10th Ward. We represent a strong 10th Ward. Candidates, please, please, if you can gain your composure, if you can stick with the questions and not attack each other, okay? Because we, 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 will, we will shut the forum down and we will go home. We wanna be able to get the questions answered that everyone has. Do we agree? Okay. question. Uh, this has to do with immigration and citizenship. Candidates, Centro de Trabajadores Unidos has assisted over 270 residents to obtain citizenship. This program under Immigrant Integ Integration Services is part of Illinois Department of Human Services and currently under review for el elimination. Most recently, the U.S. Census estimates that 15,097 immigrants live in the 10th Ward, and 47% of those residents are naturalized citizens. So the question is, will you proactively advocate for funding on behalf of Illinois Refugee and Immigrant Services Program and reach out to our governor to support funding for this program? Ms. Garza? Yes. This ward was built by immigrants. My great grandfather came from Poland and my father in law came from Mexico. It's very important that we celebrate each other's diversity. And the current administration wants to keep us divided because that's how they keep political control. I totally believe that 
It's very important. I have worked with immigrants in this city, in our ward, to take them to get the resources they need downtown, as well as within our ward. We need to make sure that the opportunities are afforded to everyone, not just the select few. I have a strong record of supporting immigrant rights, not only across the city, but in the 10th Ward in particular. And obviously this city, this ward, this entire nation is made up of immigrants. No one is better or worse than other. Anyone else, we all deserve a chance. Specifically, I've worked on resolutions to urge the federal government to take action on everything from the DREAM Act, which is too far late. We should have had that enacted years ago. I've worked directly with Immigrant Workers Project and trying to assist them. I've been at OLG when we had immigration fairs and we've had immigration debates. I understand the importance of working with people to make dreams a reality. And yes, I will work directly with the governor and the president and our Congress to urge that legislation is passed, including appropriate funding to ensure that immigrants are treated fairly. Ms. Garza, do you want to give a rebuttal? Thank you for your answers. Um, we have another question. Um, yeah, now we have a question on lakeside development. Is this uh, microphone working? The lakeside development will be the largest development in the region. Taxes will help support it. $119 million in TIF funds have been committed to it. $65 million was spent on the Lakeshore Drive extension, which runs through the development. The Coalition for a Lakeside CB has drafted a proposed community benefits agreement, a written agreement with the developer outlining commitments to the community. The CBA includes jobs, training, and educational opportunities for local residents, environmental protections, and supporting tax relief for long-time residents. So the question is, do you specifically support the coalition's CBA? How will you support co coalition efforts to get a CBA for lakeside development? What do you think are the top priorities? Alderman Pope. I do support a CBA, Community Benefits Agreement, for the lakeside development and I've shown my commitment in dealing with the community to ensure that they are represented. For years, we've been working to try to revitalize that site, which will in turn revitalize the neighborhood. And the community has and will continue to be heard. Because of the involvement and input of the community, changes have been made along the development of that site, including the realignment of the US 41, including creating the east-west connections for those streets to ensure the neighborhood is not cut off, and ensuring that any development will include people's input. I do favor CBA, and I favor a board, which some of the people here today are part of, to ensure that we're not just talking about a community benefits agreement, but the overall development of the project for years to come. And some of you here in the audience, like Angela, were part of a conversation that we had a few weeks ago to ensure that community input is in place, to ensure that our wants and needs are heard and taken into account. Just to clarify. Just, just very quickly, Alderman. To clarify, do you specifically support the coalition's CBA? I support a CBA, which may include all or more of this CBA. Uh, Ms. Ms. Garza. Yes. I have been part of the coalition. I have attended numerous meetings, which you have not been at. A CBA is imperative because it will prioritize local residents for jobs, provide job training and educational support for local schools, and it will so, guarantee affordable... So I'm sorry, just hold your train of thought. Again, we're not attacking on both sides, please. Please. It'll provide job training and educational supports for local schools. It'll guarantee affordable housing, and it supports tax relief for, lo for local residents and provides environmental protections. This is vital to our community's survival. I have attended numerous workshops, planning meetings, and demonstrations for the CBA, the coalition's CBA, and I will continue to push, push for the coalition's CBA. We cannot allow our community to be stolen by profit-driven developers and corrupt elected politicians. <laughs> Thank you. 
Alderman Pope, you have 30 seconds to appear. Yeah, thank you. I, I've been involved with this development since day one. It's been a slow, challenging process, but we are making progress. And it's because of the involvement with all the community. And I am very familiar with the Lakeside CBA and have been involved with that and met with individuals representing that on numerous occasions. I think the priorities are to create affordable and market rate housing, because we need to spur more economic development and create opportunities for all. Also local job opportunities, including training and job preparedness to ensure that people from the neighborhood can get those jobs, and tax relief measures to ensure And Ms. Garza, you have 30 seconds. All right, just want to remind everyone to hold their applause to the end. All right, Lakeside Development is expected to offer 139,000 plus jobs over the next 30 years. Meanwhile, South Chicago has 17% unemployment, 30% of the people living in poverty, and a high number of formerly incarcerated youth and adults. Question. What are your plans to connect both students and residents from the surrounding neighborhoods to the local economic opportunities, especially at the Lakeside Development? Candidate Garza, we're gonna start with you. What are your plans to connect both students and residents from the surrounding neighborhoods to the local economic opportunities, especially at Lakeside Development? Well, uh, it's imperative that the community has an input in this project. Um, it's, if we don't have a say in it, the things that will go up there will not be green jobs for the community. We need to make sure that the people in this ward have a say in what's been put on that land. We need to make sure that the people that live in the bush aren't gentrified out. I will make sure that the people that live here have a say in what's built and how that have a say in what kind of jobs are brought there. I think that's imperative. And I'd also like to see a, a hospital, a trauma center would be good. So I think we should work, we can work together to achieve that goal. If you could hold your applause, please. Yeah. And to ensure that local residents, as the question asked, uh, have an opportunity for employment, I think, again, you've got to get back to the community benefits agreement and an RDA, and to prepare the potential workers for those jobs. Not just education, which we're doing a good job at in terms of offering some state-of-the-art opportunities at our local colleges, like the Olive Harvey College, where transportation, distribution, and logistics is a major program. Like offering GED and ESL in the community. Making sure that potential employees have skills that are available to meet the demands of the future. But also preparing, realistically, some of our folks who have challenges. Drug and alcohol abuse, criminal records, and just the overall lack of training. So those are elements that you have to implement to ensure that local folks get the job and having communication like we have with representatives from Lakeside who now have a database of people who are interested in jobs or opportunities to serve as contractors or subcontractors in the process. I encourage all of you to take part in that. That ensures that when there is an opportunity, you will be the first one called. All right, thank you, Alderman Pope. Hold your applause, please. Candidate Garza, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. Okay. All right. On education, we have heard about the skills gap at companies looking to hire. Lakeside will have an estimated 97,000 construction jobs, and it will be a high-tech development. Yet, our high schools have lost a number of related programs. CVCA has lost a number of vocational programs. Bowen has lost their drafting program. CVCA has a STEM program and a partnership with Motorola, although they're located in the, in the suburbs, and it's difficult for students to uh, get to summer jobs sometimes there. They get summer jobs and receive college credits. Cisco Systems, a lakeside partner, has a STEM program with a high school on the north side, but not here. So the question is, how will you support STEM programs and vocational programs to ensure that the students in our community have the skills needed to get careers in our neighborhood, especially in light of the lakeside development being one of the largest sources of jobs over the next 30 to 40 years? Uh, Alderman Pope. 
Yes, I think we all realize that those kind of technical programs like STEM are essential to preparing our youth for the jobs that will be available for the future. That's why I'll continue to support those, and there's actually, at a local level, both Jane Addams and Washington High School at Washington Elementary are pursuing STEM programs to ensure that our kids are ready for the future. With Lakeside in particular, yes, they have relationships with Cisco Systems and other groups like Skidmore Owen, one of the largest architectural firms in the world. Those people, those individuals, need to step up and ensure that they're part of the process so that they can share their skills and talents with local communities who they impact by developing that. Through the redevelopment agreement and the CBA, those kind of opportunities will be put in stone and ensure that people have the opportunity to participate in them. Every school deserves a STEM and vocational program, not just a select few. CPS is District 299 and every school should be funded equally. And every student should have the same opportunity, not just in Lincoln Park, but, and not just on the North Shore, but in the 10th Ward as well. I will continue to fight for an elected school board so we can make these possibilities happen. We need to provide our students with the opportunity to excel regardless if it's a college or a trade school. Our students should have a choice and they need access to resources to help them with college applications and access to the apprenticeship programs. We need a central location in our ward that will help youth find these resources. The budget cuts to our schools that you spoke of was voted on, was voted yes by Rahm Emanuel and other people as well. I will not be a rubber stamp alderman that votes yes on everything that comes out. Hold it, hold it. Alderman Pope, you have 30 seconds. Yes, uh, we do need more programs and have implemented and will continue to implement more programs. For the CDL program at Isle of Harvey, to as I mentioned, the STEM programs that we're pursuing at Jane Addams and Washington, to the very successful International Baccalaureate program at Washington High School. And we have designated a site to be mindful of the future of our community and the students' needs, a site on the Lakeside site for a high school already, knowing that a high school will be eventually needed on the site and that the site should provide that property for them. We should also continue to work with the Calumet Area Industrial Commission, who is a large provider of technical and industrial services to all of our employees. And I work with my office for job fairs and outreach. Ms. Garza, 30 seconds. We cannot wait for, we cannot wait for 20 years for a, a high school to come. We cannot wait 20 years for our kids to have a place to go. We have to stop corporations from profiting at our kids' expense, and we have to stop the expansion of charter schools. Our, we, can, we can use TIF money to fund our schools and repair buildings that are already in the TIF ward, not build roads to Walmart and Pullman. Can you please hold your applause? Hold your applause, it'll be a time. May I respond? Thank you. Um, I'm proud to say that we're currently building our third elementary school in the 10th Ward. In addition to New Sullivan, Marsh, now we have a new school in the southeast side, all of which are neighborhood community schools. And we, can and you please hold your money, applause? We're going to be investing another $4.4 .4 million in two elementary schools in the ward to improve them, to make sure that they're physically fit so our kids can get the best education possible. I think my opponent is misspeaking when she talks about money going to another place that was going towards economic development. Most definitely, not before the end of May, but tomorrow. I understand that when people are working, they're struggling to make dollars. When they're not working, it's even that much more difficult. So being able to collect workers' comp is essential, and not the bare bones, but as much as possible. I'm proud to have supported legislation on the city council level to provide people opportunity to make a decent wage, raising the minimum wage, so that 400,000 people, 400,000 people in Chicago, including many of us here, can come out of poverty. And more recently, we paused to pass some other laws, paying people for sick time. 
If you get hurt, if you get hurt on the job or paid sick leave, you get paid for your sick leave. It's something that we have to provide for people when they're not working so they can support their family. People are not making huge dollars here. They have kids. They need to have substantial income so they can provide for their families and contribute to our economy. I have a history of standing up for the working class and making sure that they get the benefits that they, that they deserve and that they need to have a productive life. Um, you talk about raising the minimum wage. We need $15 an hour now, not $13 an hour in five years. Uh, we have people that live in our ward that work three jobs to try to make ends meet and still have no health insurance and no sick days. That's a trickle-down effect because that affects the family unit and children are raising themselves while parents are out trying to make a living. We need to make sure and we need to work together to ensure that we get what's deserved of us, not just the 1%. If you can please discuss specifically about workers' compensation. Yes, as it is a state legislative issue, it's incumbent it's a come upon elected officials, whether you be at the state level or the local level like an alderman, to work with your colleagues at the legislature to let them know where, what you want, what your residents want. That's why I've worked successfully with our state reps and state senators in passing various legislation, including the environment. I called up Congressman Kelly just yesterday to talk about an issue. So although I don't take the vote, it's incumbent upon me to represent the 10th Ward to let those people in Springfield, our senators and our state representatives, to know that we want this passed. Yes, it is true. It is a state vote. It's not a vote that we would be taking in city council, but it's very important that we can educate people on what their rights are as citizens and as workers to make sure that they know that they have, they can get workman's compensation and we can educate them on if they do get hurt on where they can go to get those benefits. That's very important. One of the things that happens is a lot of people, especially immigrants, don't know what their rights are. So as, as your alderman, I would hold workshops to educate people on what their rights are in the workplace and make sure that working class families get what they deserve. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alderman Pope and Candidate Garza. Um, these are issues of concern to all of us. We appreciate your responses. Now we will have some questions from an audience. Just a reminder and the guidelines for the questions. Respect everyone present. Questions will be read for both candidates to answer. We will only read the questions that are not repetitive and nonpartisan. We will not read any questions that have personal attacks associated with it. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to each question. We plan to end the meeting at 7.15, um, so we'll take as many questions as, many questions as possible. Um, here is the first question from our audience. What are you going to do to attract businesses to the east side because we have to be the only major neighborhood with no Chase Bank or even a Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, Ms. Garza. I think it's very important that we attract jobs here. There's a lot of programs that we can use. Um, TIF funds can be used to attract jobs to our neighborhood. Um, if you look at Ewing Avenue, um, it's, it's not what it used to be. Um, $8.5 million was taken out of the Ewing Avenue TIF and given to Walmart to build a road in Pullman. It's not even in our ward. That money could be used to entice small business and give them incentives to stay here and to hire people from within our ward. So not only would we, we, would we, be, would we be increasing job, uh, our business district, but we can have a community benefits agreement with those employers too to hire people from within our ward. We've had success throughout the ward, South Chicago East Side, Hegwich, South Daring, Jeffrey Manor are bringing businesses in, but never enough. Uh, here in the South Chicago community, we're helpful in bringing Royal Bank, having a brand new facility built there. And speaking of banks, former LaSalle Bank was built right on Commercial Avenue to serve our community. But we do have to use the tools, the incentives that we have available, from TIF to the Enterprise Zone to 6Bs and 7Bs. Those are tax incentives that attract people, attract businesses. It's very competitive out there, and you've got to have a set of tools and be able to market the neighborhood in order to attract them. One of our greatest assets, however, 
is our people and our good, skilled, working people. They have the ability to fill those jobs and make those jobs become a reality for businesses throughout the war. We are situated financially and physically in a great area with transportation, trains, water, and highways that we can get more businesses. And we're continuing to do that working with established organizations like the City of Chicago, the local Chambers of Commerce, the Industrial Commission, and other state agencies. Can you please hold your applause so we can get as many questions in as possible? What are your plans for Pet Coke and addressing the health issues it creates for the community? Um, Alderman Pope. Sue had, Sue had answered the first one. Whoever wants to answer it first. Now, I'm proud of the efforts that we as a community have made to address pet coke, and not just pet coke, but other issues. During the last couple of several years, we've taken strict, aggressive actions to address the issue of pet coke in our community, pet coke that has existed for over 100 years. And specifically, because of tough legislation introduced in the city council and approved in coordination with the mayor, governor, and elected officials, including Robin Kelly and Senator Durbin, we're able to make a real impact on getting rid of pet coke in our community. And we've seen the results. KCBX is closing down their north terminal. BP, the international company they are, will not ship pet coke to not only Chicago, but to the entire state of Illinois. And pet coke is no longer operational under Beamster Board. We passed legislation that will prohibit companies from coming in and pass the strictest regulations. If they want to come, they've got to respect the community. And this is not something new. I've fought polluters in the past and will continue to do so. From fighting waste management on two occasions, Carmoose Lime on the east side closing them down. This is another example of the All right, thank you, Alderman. Thank you. Yeah. Hold your applause, please. Kenny Garza. The legislation that was made possible to uh, rid our community of what you say is pet, you know, the pet coke was made possible by the people of this neighborhood. That's where it came from. Um, you talk about this, the north terminal closing, the south terminal is expanding. So they're really just shipping it from one side to the next. So don't be fooled. Um, the pet coke, I have been on the forefront of the pet coke issue. Two years ago, we sat around a table and formed People Against Pet Coke and worked with the Southeast Environmental Task Force and um, brought these, leg these people, the, the community, to legislate against pet coke. So I will continue to fight against corporate polluters and I will never take money from people who are polluting our neighborhood. Okay, all right, candidate Gaza. Next question, what are your opinion on term limits? I believe eight, I believe two terms as aldermen is sufficient. I believe that people should be given the opportunity to um, come in and have a voice. I think that after um, sitting on an alderman's seat for 16 years, no personal, attacks? no personal attacks. Okay. Okay. At, at sitting in the alderman's chair or the president or whomever for a long time, you become complacent and comfortable, and you forget about where your voice, what your voice is supposed to be. You're supposed to be a voice of the people as a public official. So I believe that two terms is sufficient. That's what it is for our president. It should hold true throughout. Alderman Pope. I have no opposition to term limits. Let me remind you though that these jobs and some of the challenges that you face take a long time to deal with. And we've seen that with the Lakeside site. We've been dealing with that for what, 16 years? And we're still moving forward. So it does take time. Anyone who's involved with major developments knows it takes time. Okay, this is kind of an open question. What is your number one concern as an East Side res resident and as alderman? My number one concern as a Southeast side resident is jobs and creating more jobs, more opportunities for all of us. And jobs is one part of the formula, the solution that makes a better neighborhood. If people don't have jobs, they don't have the ability to make money to provide for their families, usually they commit, or some of them result to crime. 
If people don't have a quality education, they don't have the ability to get a good job. So education, crime, and jobs are so intertwined. We need to create more jobs to lift people out of poverty, to allow them to live the American dream, stay in our community, and continue to contribute to our Southeast Side community. Definitely jobs. Our campaign took a survey and we heard from the people, and the people's number one concern was jobs as well. Um, as your alderman, I will work very hard to create new jobs within the 10th Ward and use TIF money to entice those small, small business and large businesses to come to ensure that there are jobs here. I also have a priority of giving the people of the 10th Ward a voice, something that we haven't had for a very long time. No one's ever asked us what we want, what we need, or what we'd like to see here, and it's time that we stand up and we say, we want our ward back. If you are elected or re-elected, will, will you vote to take down the red lights? The red light cameras, I'm assuming that's what this question is. Yes. Absolutely, positively, yes. On my first day, I will pass some kind of legislation to get rid of them. It's another way of balancing the budget on the backs of the working class. There's a study done by the Chicago Tribune, and actually some intersections that have red light cameras are actually have higher accidents. So it's not about safety, it's about a, an underlying way of take, getting money off of people that don't really have money. There's, we have three speed cameras in our neighborhood, and they're all, they're not around a park, they're not around a school, which is what they're supposed to be at, and they're not in those locations. The 10th board has zero, no red light cameras. And there are speed cameras where there's been a history of accidents near churches, near schools, where there's hundreds of feet of guardrail because of the accidents that have occurred over the years, not just endangering people, but their properties. I see cameras as a means to allow our police officers who are overburdened to concentrate on the more serious crimes. That's why I support getting more police off the street, unlike some people who are not favoring additional police officers. That's why we can use technology to work towards our advantage, to allow our police to concentrate on the issues that are serious and of issue to our community. Technology is the key. Use that. Free up police officers. Let them deal with the gangbangers, the true criminals in the neighborhood, not ticketing people who should be driving sensibly as it is. What will you do to help the formerly incarcerated get jobs? As we have been doing and continue to do, work with those agencies who provide the services to make them hireable, like the expungement. Actually, today we may have a flyer that we're promoting the, expun promoting the expungement process. We have people coming into our office all the time looking for jobs. That's why we have an employment book there. But not just an employment book, but resources that allow them to be job ready. As I mentioned before, a lot of folks have problems with alcohol and drug abuse. They have criminal records. We need to get those addressed as soon as possible to make them eligible to go to work. Also, expired driver's license are suspended. We work closely with the Secretary of State to expedite those processes as soon as possible, make sure they're ready. And job training programs, job readiness programs, so that all those folks are ready. And we've taken action in the City Council to ensure that those type of folks are considered for being hired. Actually, the mayor just did a program with the Park District that favors and targets formerly incarcerated individuals to encourage that they work. And actually next week, we're doing a hiring program for the new Eastside Elementary School, the third one, the community school that be, is being built in our community and local preference is giving Thank to minorities Alderman. and residents. We will now move to close the remarks from each of you. Oh, I'm sorry. Drug and alcohol, people that suffer from drug and alcohol abuse and people that me have mental health issues were affected tremendously because of budget cuts that were voted on by some people and Rahm Emanuel that closed 52 mental health centers across the city. It's very important that um, 
we understand that nobody, ha people have a hard time hiring ex-felons, and there are there is a ward in the city right now that used TIF dollars to hire 28 people that were convicted of felonies, and they put them in Dawson Technical Institute, and they used those people to give them jobs to rehab homes within their ward, and then they turned those homes around and sold them back to people in their ward. Six years later, 24 of those 28 people were still working. Those were, they used TIF funds to create those programs. That is something that we could do here within the 10th Ward that would help not just our neighborhood, but the people as well. And that's where I'd like to see things happen differently here. We move to closing remarks from each of you. You have a minute to give your closing address. May I remind you to be respectful to each other. Since we begin with Alderman Pope for the opening statement, um, we'll begin with Susan Salaski Garza. I know if you make it possible for people to participate in the process of running their neighborhood, their ward, and their city, they will come up with good and effective ideas to run their ward and to make things better. My incumbent is old school. He doesn't trust people to know that they know what's, what they want. His vote in city council comes from conversations with Mayor Rahm Emanuel. No personal attacks. My, my, his, my votes will come from conversations with the people. I'm more interested in bringing people together, not tearing people apart. It's time that we unite the 10th Ward and be 55,000 voices strong to get what we deserve. And the people in the 10th Ward deserve better than what we've been getting. That's for sure. Hold your applause, please. Alderman Pope. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Amalia and Asi for putting on this forum today and all the folks have come out. Um, I think this election, no, I know this election is about choice and the choice to move forward. And we can continue to improve our ward, as challenging as it is, make progress each and every day. That includes less crime, better education, more jobs, and lower property taxes. Issues that I differ on with several people. Or we can move backwards. We can have less police, more guns on the street, higher property taxes, and no vision. I've been proud to represent this ward in some of its toughest times. I've been proud of the successes we've had, but I'm not satisfied. We have a litany of accomplishments, but we have so many more needs. And I'm the best qualified, I'm the best experienced, and I work across the board with everyone to ensure that our voice is heard. And I will continue to represent you, and I look forward to your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Pope. May I have your attention, please? We will now move, we will now have Amalia Nieto Gomez from the Alliance of Southeast to ask one final question. Please respond with yes or no. So, if you're elected our next alder person, uh, will you meet with the community organizations organizing this event within 30 days of your administration? Um, and again, this is not just an ASE event, but you can tell from the banners around, we have Family Rescue, Pilgrim Baptist, Centro de Trabajadores Unidos, um, the Coalition for Lakeside CBA, Claritian Associates, um, Praise Tabernacle, um, please excuse me if I'm listening, uh, Got Pilgrim Baptist. So um, those are the organizations that have united to put uh, together this debate and forum tonight. So again, the question is, if you are elected as our next alder person, will you meet with the community organizations organizing this event within the first 30 days of your administration? So, yes, Ms. Garza. Of course. Alderman Pope. Yes, and I've met with these groups previously. I will continue to meet with them, and I've had the opportunity to attend various events in this forum right here. It's right. a continuation of my ongoing efforts. All right, thank you. So, thank you, both of you. <laughs>